We are back with another edition of SB Nation Soccer Roundtable. This time we are previewing Saturday's MLS Cup featuring the Seattle Sounders and Toronto FC. This promises to be one of the most compelling MLS Cup finals to date, with each team representing big and vocal fan bases, playing very good soccer, and featuring a slate of recognizable names. Joining us to talk about the teams are Dave Clark of Sounder at Heart and Oliver Platt of Waking the Red. So let's just get started right off the bat with the Sounders. Uh, Dave, they're dealing with a number of nagging injuries coming out of the Colorado Rapids series, most notably to Osvaldo Alonso, who sprained his knee. Uh, where are we with that? And are there any other injuries that fans should know about? With Alonzo, it looks very likely that he'll be able to play primarily because, Brian, as Brian Schmetzer said, he would be willing to give up his left arm in order to play this game. So he's not really concerned about his knee. Um, it's one of those things where he probably plays through it. And that might limit something like his horizontal um, lateral movements. But uh, at this point, the, the pairing of Alonzo and Roldan has to be maintained if the Sounders are going to go anywhere in MLS Cup. So Alonzo will play through the pain. Uh, the other question marks um, are a bunch of guys that will probably be okay because they were on their way back or had participated in uh, recent matches. That's Brad Evans, Eric Freebird, Alvar Fernandez, and Andres Ivanchitz. All of them are probably going to be in the 18. W only one of them will start, though. And then today it came out that Nelson Hato Valdez left practice early, but at this point, leaving practice early without a, a definitive statement of not going to play likely means that he uh, he travels to Toronto and starts. Very good. So uh, similarly, Sebastian Giovinco had to come out of the, the out of Toronto FC's Eastern Conference Final. Is he expected to make a full recovery? Uh, any other players who, who might be dealing with injuries, Oliver? Oh, yeah, Javinko should be fine, we think. They said they say it's just cramp that he came off with um, against Montreal. Javinko's kind of, he's really careful with his body. Like, I think he knows how much he's worth. Um, and, like, you could see, for example, in the first leg uh, of the Montreal tie, he really didn't like playing on that pitch. Uh, so if he feels anything, he kind of plays it safe a lot of the time. So I think he should be fine. Um, Otherwise, I think they're fully fit. Um, yeah, no issues apart from him coming off. But as I say, we're not too, we don't seem to be too concerned about that. So word just came out that the game sold out in three minutes. Uh, that's impressive, even if you consider that about two-thirds of those tickets were already spoken for by season ticket holders, MLS executives, traveling supporters, that kind of thing. But what's the buzz like in Toronto uh, right now, Oliver? It's building. Obviously, there's been a lot of kind of... Uh, frustration about the ticket process, which has kind of overshadowed um, the build-up of the game so far. But I think, yeah, obviously it's this pretty momentous moment for not just Toronto FC, but for all of Canadian soccer, really, to see a Canadian team playing for the MLS Cup. Um, and it's, it's happening at a time where a lot of different things seem to be kind of developing as well. So you've got obviously got the new men's national team coach coming fairly soon, we think. You've got the Canadian Premier League in the works as well. So it, it does feel like a big turning point. Yeah, and like a 1.5, I want to say it was 1.5 million Canadian viewers for that Eastern Conference final between uh, between Toronto FC and Montreal Impact. That's a huge number. I mean, that's a number that MLS in the United States, I don't know, has, has ever had a million and a half viewers in the United States. And obviously, the United States is a much bigger country. Does this feel like a, a, a an environment, like a situation that has been embraced by the whole country, or is that overstating it? I think so, yeah. Like Obviously, the nature of the Montreal tie was that there was two fan bases contributing to the TV numbers and so on, but it's still a huge increase. Like, um, even just the English language uh, average TV viewership was about 800,000, I think, and like regular season games didn't touch six figures, so it's an enormous boost to what they'd normally get. Um, and yeah, I, I think it is a countrywide thing. I, I think there's obviously a lot of interest in Toronto as well, and I think I read a tweet somewhere today saying MLSE have basically compared or it felt like to them the ticket demand for the uh, cup final tickets was similar to a Raptors playoff game. So that's, you know, a, a kind of big step in the right direction in terms of competing with the other major sports in the city. So Dave, is, is all of the United States behind the Sounders then? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, the Sounders fan base 
is already targeted a lot for you know the the memes about Seattle invented stuff and we're arrogant and aloof out here in the upper left and frankly it's it's probably all true I mean we're not you're not going to see Portland fans rooting for Seattle you're not going to see anybody making a statement that you know just because the Sounders are there means that American soccer has come um, and advanced to some level uh, the numbers will probably be big because it's on broadcast Fox rather than uh, on a cable only station and that's the first time since 2008 there'll be a, a Spanish language broadcast as well so that'll help out and uh, so while it'll be big numbers that has more to do with it being compelling than it does with people actually liking the Seattle Sounders that said, there's, uh, I guess, about 1,500 Sounders fans that are expected to make this trip, or at least the Sounders had 1,500 tickets to to disperse to their fans. How has Does it feel like there's a lot of – that the, the traveling support is going to be strong? Do you get a sense that this is going to be a, a good Sounders turnout? Absolutely. It's, it's going to be strong. I know that the, uh, the majority of the Sounders tickets were in two sections – with uh, ECS's uh, slightly smaller section with uh, somewhere in between 350 and, and 400 tickets is all in that same corner of the stadium. They're gonna treat that as a general admission area. And then next to them are gonna be the, uh, the more standard fan that won tickets through the season ticket lottery and, and other methods, uh, you know, friends and family of the team and those kinds of things as well. So it, it's gonna be, an interesting fan base. The uh, the bright green will stick out against the red fairly well, unless you're uh, unless you are colorblind. In which case, uh, hopefully uh, the teams find a way to to alleviate some of that because uh, I know uh, we've we've had experience with with writers in the area when uh, when it's all all red versus all green, the game can get a little muddled for some people. Uh, so the other question I had about the. The sad, so one of the, the, the narratives that's kind of been building going into this game has been this idea that the Sounders are finally in an MLS Cup. And, and it, on one hand, I get it. It's obviously this is a the eighth year. The Sounders had been kind of knocking on the door for a while. This is the first time they, they broke through. But on the other hand, it seemed a little ridiculous that you're talking about a, a fan base waiting all of eight years to get to, an, to a, a championship game. Uh, d- does this feel like a relief to, to you? Does it feel like it, the Sounders have, have kind of gotten to the mountaintop, even if it hasn't, even if they haven't summited yet? I, I don't know. How would you describe your feelings around the uh, the buildup and, and kind of the weight that went into this game? There was definitely a, hey, we finally made it on uh, Sunday after, after the team won. Uh, over in Colorado, but I think by the time we found out that it was at Toronto, things had kind of faded away. It was no longer about finally. It was about um, taking the next step in uh, this journey, and a lot of this season has been about that. That you've got to win, you've got to win the next game in order for there to be another game. They have been so far behind that this uh, this approach of everything being a must win was was nearly true. I mean, if they hadn't had such an such a great winning streak and Toronto also had a great winning streak in the uh, late summer and fall. I mean, that's kind of what both teams used to, to get themselves here. So it, it's not about finally, because uh, frankly, making the playoffs eight straight years is, is actually quite an accomplishment. And um, it, it's one that maybe I've overplayed over, over time, but I think that Sounders fans have to recognize that eight straight years in the playoffs is an extraordinary run. Um, Toronto fans uh, would probably kill to have eight playoff appearances, you know, if we're talking about finally, we're talking right there. That's a, an older, org, older organization. And for them, it is finally. So I actually wanted to talk to you about that, Oliver. This is the, the, I guess the, the 10th season that Toronto FC is, has been around. Uh, this is the first level of any kind of playoff success they've had. They, they'd only been to the playoffs once before that was last year. They went out in the first round against Montreal impact this year, obviously they are now in the MLS cup final and yet they weren't celebrating the same way that the Sounders were after the Eastern conference final. What do you, you know, what's the, I don't know, what's the inside the team. What's the, the, the feeling in terms of what this, this team has accomplished. Well, I think they have to be kind of careful with that. And like, I know like how disappointing it'll be if they, if they lose on Saturday, because they, it just feels like they're on such a run and they're really on a roll at the minute. And, 
everything's in this in in place for this team to to go all the way. I think so. There will be a lot of disappointment, but you have you do have to remember that this is like the second year that this team has had any kind of success, and the first year it's been actually you know a really good team. And it doesn't always happen that you you go all the way at your first attempt, you know. Um, and I think building a kind of successful contender over the next five years or so, which they're totally equipped to do with the players they have right now, is in some ways just as important as this season's run. Um, but there is so much momentum behind them. And, and obviously the Montreal tie was just so crazy that it starts to feel kind of like destiny for them to go all the way this year. Um, so there will be a lot of disappointment if they don't win it. But I, th- I think that's something that, you know, at least uh, in the front office, the organisation has to bear in mind that it's not kind of the end of the world next year. They will be back next year and be very strong if things don't go their way on Saturday. So along those lines, uh, we know that Toronto FC's offensive success has been kind of defined by Sebastian Giovinco and Josie Altidore. They're clearly big players, important players. They've played wonderfully during the playoffs. But on the same token, what what should fans be watching for? Who's a player outside of those two who maybe is indicative of whether the game is really going Toronto FC's way and, and who's a player that might be able to crop up and make a difference if it's not one of those two? I think I'd say the midfielders either side of Michael Bradley are normally a pretty good sign of how things are going for the team. Um, I think they'll probably play Will Johnson again on Saturday just because he offers a bit more defensive cover and the first half in Montreal didn't go well with, you know, Bradley a little bit exposed. Um, so I guess the other one I'd say the guy who will probably be playing with Johnson and, and Bradley is Armando Cooper, um, who's kind of indicative of a few things, really. I think, firstly, they did really well to not kind of rest on their laurels in the middle of the season when they were top of the Eastern Conference for some time. And they still went out and got Cooper and Ricketts who have been, you know, big additions and have made a big difference. Um, and then I think in terms of individual games themselves, he's he's a really important player just in terms of whether they've got control of the game or not. You know, he's, he's got a lot of different sides to his game. He's very aggressive. He's a bit of a pest. He likes drawing fouls and things like that. But he's also one of the technically better players in the team. Um, and probably one of the best, uh, along with Bradley, uh, at finding Juvinko. So... If he's getting on the ball and, and making things happen, that normally things means good things are happening for the team as a whole. And the same goes with Jonathan Azorio, but he'll probably be on the bench as a result of um, Johnson coming in to provide a bit more insurance. So, Dave, the the two players that that obviously are the big guns for for the Sounders are Jordan Morris and Nicholas Ladero. Everyone knows that those are. The player that the, when the Sounders are finding success, it's oftentimes through them. But is there's got who are the players that 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 people should be uh, if there's an unsung hero on this team? Who do you think it is? Unsung hero, I'd probably go for Christian Roldan. He is Osvaldo Alana's partner in the defensive midfield. Uh, he's he's provided more of the range this year than Alonzo. He he gets around. is quite mobile, solid tacker, tackler that takes away from, takes after Alonzo in that fashion. But part of what makes him so great is he's a little bit more of an eight than Alonzo is. So he's about getting that ball forward as fast as possible. Between the two of them, they move the ball through the midfield quickly. And if Seattle is clicking, those two can pop up and provide offensive support as well. That's kind of when you know that the team has uh, taken control and is proactively managing the game is when you see both Alonzo and Roldan within about 30, 35 yards of, of goal. That means that they're getting the flow and the possession that they desire deep in the opposing territory. And um, then they'll start looking to pick out a, a Nelson Valdez, a, a Morris, and a Ladero. So go ahead and give me your prediction, Dave. Who's going to win this game? What's the score going to be? I think we're going to see extra time, and I'm going to go with a uh, – I'm going to be a negative, Nancy. I think it's going to go 2-1 for Toronto. I just think that that uh, – stopping that offense. I mean, they, they put up 12 goals against Montreal, and they've been a better goal-scoring team throughout the year. And I just think that the uh, this kind of – I've used the phrase on uh, about it before, this kind of Disney story – doesn't end with a uh, a win this year. I think the Sounders uh, 
improbable run is merely as Western Conference champions. All right, Oliver, over to you. Are you uh, are you feeling Dave prediction, or are you gonna are you gonna are you gonna balance that one out with uh, going the other way? Um, I don't know. I I have no idea after the Montreal tie. Like, who knows after that? Um, I think it's going to be close. I don't think there's going to be more than a goal in it. Um, I'm going to lean to Toronto just on home field advantage, and I, I could see a a two one or something like that as well. Yeah, I think. I think we'll definitely score, but we'll probably concede as well. So just have to hope that Javinko's firing. Well, that's a, a good place to, to call it a, a show. Both of you guys are predicting Toronto FC to win 2-1. Uh, that'll, be, uh, that'll be interesting. So I'm looking it's... forward to the riots out here when, when, this, when they, they view this. Right. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, this is SB Nation's Soccer Roundtable. Again, thanks to Dave Clark of Sounder at Heart. To Oliver Platt of Waking the Red, uh, you should give them a follow on Twitter. You can uh, read their stuff all over those sites, obviously. I'm Jeremiah O'Shan signing off on behalf of SB Nation. Let's uh, hope for a good one. <laughs>